but I'm glad that uh, most of the people who are present are diligent Bible students. And I, by the grace of God, I promise to you that you will learn something this morning. I'm happy to see you. I haven't been here for a while. I was uh, away two weeks in California, and I'm safely back. Uh, Justin is sending greetings to all of you. He's one of the students there. We spend a wonderful time, and he likes what he hears there and what he learns together with other students. I had the opportunity to meet with many brethren that I know and some new people. And uh, uh, but it is, it is good to be back in Canada and to be in Toronto. I always love to come to this church. Uh, I've been here for many years, but whenever I walk through this door in this sanctuary, I always feel special. Today we have a special event up north at Shalom by the Lake. We are having winter youth retreat. So many of our members and uh, families and children, and young people are gone, but uh, we do not close the church here, and I decided to be here with you. I'd like to share with you something that will be a continuation of that what we have studied before. We are happy to have with you our uh, neighbor Dan. You are very welcome to our church. And you're welcome anytime to join us. Any Sabbath, we have uh, spiritual food, we have physical food we offer here. And the topic I'd like to share with you is uh, a little bit for more advanced students of the Bible, but even those who are beginners should not be deprived or benefit. I'd like to talk about 144,000, but I will not pique your curiosity in terms of who are these people in terms to identify them, you know, by saying, well, what this or that. I'd like to talk about 144,000 in the land that stands with them, and what are the qualities or what are the attributes of 144,000? Character traits. Who, I mean, in terms of uh, the land, 144,000, the land with whom they stand in the Father's name. And let me start with you reading from Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Verse 2. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. This is verse 2. Verse 3. And they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts, and the elders. And no man could learn that song, but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Verse 4. These are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb. And verse 5. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. We will be analyzing these five verses that tell us much about 144,000, about their character, about their qualities. And you will see this is a very exciting study and uh, something worth pondering. So let me summarize. What are the characteristics of the 144,000? By the way, would you like to be a part of 144,000? Yes. Oh, I would. <laughs> now, if you want to be part of them, let's see what are their characteristics. According to Revelation 14, 1 to 5, these are the characteristics. They are standing on the Mount Zion with the Lamb. One thing. Second, had with his father's name written on their foreheads. Three, sing a new song, which is song of Moses and of the Lamb. Four, not defiled with women. The virgins will see what that means. Five, follow the Lamb with us wherever he go. Six, there are first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And finally, in the mouth was found of God. Would you like to be in the company of such people? I would. I would be, I would like to be part of that company, of that number, but I also would like to be together with them. I would like to have my neighbors and my friends and my family members, everyone have these qualities. 
So what is that significance of the 144,000 mentioned in Revelation 14? We will be now analyzing uh, these verses one by one of these qualities. And what I will do, I will go to other scriptures and show and connect these qualities, what they really mean to be standing with the Lamb on the Mount Zion. What does it mean to have the Father's name written in our foreheads? What does it mean to be not defiled with women? What does it mean to, you know, having no God? We will be analyzing these qualities one by one and connecting with the Bible, with the scriptures. Often there is an argument and debate who will be that number. But we often neglect, most of the time we neglect to see what are the qualities, character qualities. And if you have these qualities, you don't worry speculating who will be there. Just be that. And now you will see that we, we can have, we have opportunity to be part of the 44,000. We are invited, we are told in the spirit of prophecy, strive with all God-given power to be among them. So when you hear something like that, we should take it seriously. And let's study what does it mean to be, you know, part of that number and what are the qualities. Let's start with Revelation 15, 5, 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. In Revelation, there is a throne scene, chapter 4 and chapter 5 of Revelation. John sees the glory of God, he sees these celestial beings, he sees 24 elders, he sees these um, uh, creatures praising God, and then he sees what? Lamb as it had been slain. Who is that lamb? What do you think? <coughs> Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ and him crucified, right? So he has given his life. But then I would like to connect, because we are told that 144,000 stand together with the Lamb on the Mount Zion. So we have to look a little bit closer into that land. Who is that land? What is significance of 144,000 being together with the land on the Mount Zion? And we are told in John 1.29, John the Baptist, seeing Jesus, he says, Look, the land, or behold the land of God, who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God, coming to be baptized, and he takes away the sin of the world. But let me connect this verse with another text. In Revelation 13, 8, Jesus is called a lamb slain from when? From the foundation of the world. I had one of the exam questions for the students about exactly this thing. We were talking about the Jesus Christ and uh, significance of the cross. And was the, or, or actually significance of the fall of man, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, what was the significance of that? And the question was this, was that the time when the plan of salvation was initiated or not? No. <laughs> plan of salvation has existed from eternity. God they prepared the plan. God is never taken by surprise. He is always ready. He knew what would happen. So he had a plan and Jesus was willing to give his life to save us. This is why he's called the lamb slain from the beginning, from the foundation of the world. When the plans are made for creation of this world, this planet Earth, then God made a plan or actually initiated. So Christ. Now, why is it significant? That 144,000 are with the Lamb. Very important. Brothers and sisters, we studied in our lesson moments ago that what? There will be a people who will have God's law in their heart. But these people also depend every moment of their life on Jesus Christ. They follow Him every step of the way. Wherever He goes, they are with Him. So he is first up their savior and then redeemer and then he is also their priest, high priest, empowering them to live life of holiness. 
but you first need him as your redeemer to save you. So you need a slain lamb, but that lamb is alive, and that lamb is able to do something for them. Now let's read Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame him. How? By the blood of the lamb. These are conquerors. These are redeemed people. In the great controversy, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Let me ask you a question. How do you and I overcome Satan by the blood of Jesus? You remember Martin Luther? How he had a kind of a vision or appearance of dream that Satan was kind to him and charging him with a sin. And there was an ink uh, in, in the bottle and it spilled and simply covered the sin. <laughs> so Satan is coming charging us with sin. You did this, you did that, you did that. You know that in Zechariah, the Joshua and the high priest and the, and the angel, right? And he was called how? In filthy garment. Representing high priest carries the sin of the people, representing. And what was command was given? And Satan was standing by to accuse. And what we are told, the command was taken and given, take that filthy garment and put him on him. White, sparkling white garment, right? So the sin is taken transferred, so we need Jesus Christ as Savior. And by the word of the testimony, what is the word of the testimony? This is our experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what we tell. What God has done for us and in us. How He changed our lives. And the love, not the lives unto the death. These are the victorious people. Overcome Him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of the testimony. And the love, not the lives unto the dead. They are together with the Lamb. They are 144,000. Brethren, 144,000 will spend eternity in the immediate presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Father. Could you imagine that? In the temple serving Him day and night. They had a unique experience. And we are living today in the time when 144,000 are being gathered and prepared. This should be a very important topic for us to understand their qualities. And I want to encourage you today in this study that you look at them and how they gain the victory and how they qualify to be in that group. So we come back to this text. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now when we talk about taking away the sin of the world, we are coming to which place in the, if you look at the Jewish economy, if you look at the Jewish economy, where was the place where the sins were dealt with? Where did we go? Huh? Central. At central. Old Testament, New Testament, the method how God saves us has not changed. God, His conditions of salvation have never changed. So there is a law of God for the holiness and righteousness. When we talk about this holiness and righteousness, there is an interesting, this is an interesting problem that was actually addressed even by Greek philosophers. And this was the question about the ultimate good, because they also recognized that God, is, you know, God must be good. But then they asked the question, is good something that God wills? He just says this is good, and then good is arbitrary, as God says. Or is good something that is outside of God, and God simply has to acknowledge it, recognize it as outside? So if that is outside of God, and God is under that value or virtue which is outside of Him, or good is simply something that God arbitrarily says that's good. And neither option is optimal for the Supreme Being. But you know the solution to that problem is very simple and beautiful. The good is actually in God. God is the good. Amen. And when God commands something, God doesn't command something which is outside of Him, but God simply says something which is according to Him. So when we say that the law of God is the transcript of God's character, that's it. This is the good. 
You know when people came to Jesus and said, good master, what shall I do to repay eternal life? In Christ as a man says, why do you call me good? There is only one good, and this is Father, God, right? God is good. So God is the epitome or essence of goodness. So we call it transcript of his character. We act because of the command coming outside to us, but God acts according it is his very nature. He does good. Now, I don't want to go too far, but when we come to this good, absolute good, absolute righteousness, we are guilty, we have sinned, and we need salvation. So God has the, to solve the problem of sin, and that problem is solved in the century. Okay, so you are in the Old Testament, you have sinned, I have sinned, and what do we do? We need an animal sacrifice. So we bring the animal sacrifice, we confess the sin with our hands, and then we take the life of the animal, and have to, animal, have to live in the Old Testament times, killing the animals would be really very, very painful experience for me. I don't like that. And this is the main reason why I'm a vegetarian, I don't like killing animals whatsoever. So anyway, you have to bring the animal, kill the animal, and then you need a priest. Now, a priest takes the blood and takes it in the first compartment of the sanctuary, and he sprinkles the blood there on the altar, and also blood on the veil. But now sin is transferred to the sanctuary, from you, through the animal blood, typifying the blood of Jesus through the sanctuary. But the problem of sin is not yet solved. <clears throat> sin is there, deposited in the sanctuary. When is the sin finally disposed of and removed from the sinner and from the sanctuary? They are torment. They are torment. This is one day in the year when sin is finally removed. But you will see that earth the sanctuary could not deal with that problem completely. And you will see why. Because the blood of animals cannot take permanently sin. You need something better than animal blood and earth the priest, human priest who is still a sinful being. So then we need that they are torment when they reach the final disposition of sin or removal of sin from the sanctuary and from the sinner. And this is beautiful, you know, this is their judgment. And then the saints, high priest, enters the most holy place and removes the sin. Now let me read you, uh, lead you to Hebrews 10, 1 and 2. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. Yes. The Jews were going you know, to, the, to the animal sacrifices to the temple, but these animal sacrifices and these human priests could not take away the sin completely, finally, permanently, because this is imperfect. And then verse 2, For then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshippers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. If the animal sacrifices could really take care of all human sin, there would be no need to repeat it, to repeat the sacrifices, and for the priests go every year on the day of atonement in the most holy place. There would be no need for that if these animal sacrifices and earthly priests were sufficient. But they were not. They needed something better. Verse 3 and 4. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is not Possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Not possible. Not possible. This is a strong argument that the heavenly sanctuary, heavenly high priest, and his sacrifice are needed, necessary. Then they come to Hebrews, and but what is the main point? We are talking here and this sermon, please remember, it's a central thought. We are going beyond forgiveness of sins with 144,000. We are going to the transforming power of divine grace, as we study in the Sabbath school lessons, that change human beings. Not only what Christ does for us, but what Christ does in us through the Holy Spirit. Because these people are really holy people, transform people. And then I want to show you next text, Hebrews 9, 27, 28. 
and as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him, for his coming, to appear, right? People who will be waiting for him to come. The second time without sin unto salvation. So when Christ comes the second time, so he came once, we are told, once over to bear the sins. Sin bearing sacrifice, right? Sin bearing Savior. He's pardoning our, our, our sins, our guilt. But when he comes the second time, he will appear for those who are waiting for him. He will appear without sin or apart from sin unto salvation. Which means he will, in heavenly sanctuary, completely erase all the sins. And on the earth, there will be people of God who will also have experience of soul temple cleansing. They will also be free from power of sin. They will reflect the image of Christ perfectly. So something will happen here on earth. And this is why we talk about them being with the Lamb, 144,000. In their lives, both forgiveness of sins has been completed and also purification for the power of sin has been completed. This is a unique experience in Earth's history. And this, there will be people of God on Earth who will have that experience. Second time in the grants, no sin. These are 144,000. Let me now talk about second quality. This is why we talked about 144,000 being the land on the Mount Sinai, which means they are victors. They overcame by the blood of Jesus and the word of their testimony. The power of God, the gospel was manifest, the power of salvation. There are some victors that overcome us. But then we have the second quality, Father's name. It's written in their foreheads. Let me share with you a text. From Isaiah 57, 15. For thus said the high and lofty one that inhabited eternity, whose name is Holy. I dwell in a high and holy place, with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to, re to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So with whom does God dwell? With those who are humble and contrite. This is opposite to being proud, to be arrogant and self-righteous. The problem with Laodiceans is that what they are saying, I am rich, increased with goods, and have in need of nothing, but you don't know your true condition. But these people are humble, contrite. They tremble on the word of God. And what does it say? Who says that? The one whose name is holy. That one that they mentioned, absolute goodness, absolute holiness. He is the one who speaks. Let me give you another text about God's name. Matthew 6, 9. And after this manner, pray thee. Therefore pray thee. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. God's name is hallowed. What does it mean to make hallowed God's name? Holy. Yeah. Hold it. Holy. View it as holy. God's name is holy. This is why we have the commandment, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord out. In vain, not irreverently mention God's name. God's name is holy. So if you have God's name in your forehead as a part of 144,000, what does it mean about you? Are you holy? Be therefore holy, because I am holy. So 144,000 have this experience. Holiness. My name is holy. Hallowed be thy name. You have God's name in your forehead, which means in your mind and heart you are sanctified. That's an experience that many people don't think seriously about what is 144,000. Hebrews 12, 14. We will be coming to Hebrews 12 in a moment and see how significant it is. Follow peace with all men and what? Holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. What is holiness? Sister White says, holiness is God-likeness. Holiness means two things to be holy. One use of the word holy is to set apart for the special or holy use, for God to use something. 
So utensils, temple, you know, uh, furniture, all this can be holy because it's used for holy. Fire can be holy. You know, you know how Nadab and Abihu were killed because they did not distinguish holy fire? Mm -hmm. This is a special fire that God kindled on the altar that should never go out. And they use the common fire. So whatever is used especially for God is considered holy. But that's one, one use of the word holy. The second use of the word holy means when God makes you holy, sanctifies you. That is holiness too. So we have to be holy. We need to have peace with all men and holiness without which no man can show the Lord. But now what is opposite? We, God's people, 144,000, have God's name written in their foreheads. But there is an opposite group which are not 144. And let's see what name they will have, you know, believe in Revelation 13, 17. And that no man might, this is a, you know, that decree, no man might buy or sell, say he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So God is putting his name on the forehead of his people, but Satan has also the mark of his name. Name, uh, people who had the mark or the name of the beast. Name of the beast or the mark, number of his name. So you see, on one hand, we are having 144,000, we have the Father's name, which is holiness. On the other hand, we are having these people who are worshiping the beast and receiving his mark and his name. So this is opposite of God. So we are here in the day of atonement. We are in the process of cleansing. This is important work going on right now in heavenly sanctuary. And so let's go to verse two. And I heard a voice from heaven, and the voice of many waters, and the, as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Two questions. When you find in the book of Revelation. The voice of many waters and the voice of great thunder is typically God's voice speaking. So God is speaking here. So John hears God's voice that looks like a thunder, like many waters. And then second thing, heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. So these are the saints, 144,000, and the, you know, the crown of victory, they're having harps and palms of victory. So they are playing instruments, they are playing harps. And he hears that beautiful. Every one of us, brethren, whether we are musical here or not, we will play harp in heaven. And then something else, which is very interesting, in verse 3. And they sang, not only playing the instruments, but they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. No man could learn that song, but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Have you thought about this? What song they are singing? Pardon me? This is a unique song. No one can learn that song. Only 144,000 can sing that song. And then we are told why. No man could be, but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. These are people who will be alive on the earth when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. And they have a big experience. They go through seven last plagues. They're going against the, you know, you know, that war against the beast and the mark of the beast. And they are victorious. So they have a unique experience. They will see what will happen to this world when the seven last plagues will come. And let me share with you a little bit more light. What is that song that they are singing? In Revelation 15, 3, just next chapter, verse 3, And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of the saints. So what song they are singing? Song of of Moses and the son of the Lamb. Why 144,000 can sing that song of Moses and the song of the Lamb? Why is this significant when we associate 144,000 and the Lamb and Moses? 
what experience the life of Moses and the life of Jesus Christ <coughs> brings them in connection, 144,000 and Moses and the Lamb. Now, when did Moses sing the, that song? You have, you know when? After the great victory, when they crossed the Red Sea and God gave the victory, drowned the Egyptian army and Pharaoh, you know, into the sea. And God's people came victorious. So this is the moment when they said they had uh, sang a beautiful song. And uh, now this is Revelation, uh, actually seven. I did not Revelation fifteen three. Revelation seven. I think in verse 4, it said, Heard not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed who? The servants of our God in their foreheads. So 144,000 the servants of God. And here we are told to sing the song of Moses, what? The servant of God. So Moses had a unique experience with the Lord. Leading the people of God. So 144,000, when they enter the final battle, this will be like Egyptian army. Pursuing them, and there is no way of escape. There is a Sunday law, you cannot buy or sell, and there is a dead decree if you don't worship the beast and receive the mark, and some will be killed. So you cannot escape. There is an absolute surveillance, there is absolute control. And God opens the Red Sea. He leads the people to victory and freedom, and they enter the promise. They will be entering you know, the path to promised land. So this will be their experience. But there is more to it. There is more to it. Let me show it. The son of Moses. Exodus 15, 1. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel as this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he had triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider had been thrown into the sea. So God will ultimately defeat these armies of Satan who are pursuing God's people with Sunday law and all these things. Then verse 2 and 3, The Lord is my strength and song, and he be he's become my salvation. He is my God. I will prepare him in habitation. My Father is God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. I don't have enough time to go more further, but if you go to Revelation 19, you are seeing a warrior King of kings and Lord of lords, he is riding the white horse, and he is followed by the army. And they are going into the war. And this will Jesus Christ will be directly involved in the battle, final battle with the forces of evil. And you know Revelation uh, uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. At that time shall rise who? Stand up Michael, the, who is the Prince of thy people, and he will defend God's people. At that time, we will be saved, everyone who is written in the book. Whosoever name will stay in the book of life, past the judgment, will be saved at that time. So, this is a unique experience that they will have. But I'm sharing you more about Moses. Why it's a song of Moses? In Exodus 31 32, do you know what happened in Exodus 32? We had the giving of the law in chapter 20. God came on Mount Sinai and he gave the Ten Commandments. Uh, Moses brought this uh, five tables of stone. And what did he find when he came down? People were very happy. Very happy, right? And Moses, uh, Joshua was with him and Joshua said, oh, there is a battle, there is a war. And Moses said, no, people are happy. This is uh, feasting, singing. <laughs> when they came down, what did they say? People worshiping the golden calf. And then God was very angry, and Moses was also very angry. He broke the tables of stone. And after that, God said something I will destroy these people. They are stiff like rebellious, and I will create of you, Moses, new people. And what did Moses do? Oh, yeah, that's right. Exodus 32, verse 31. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, these people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. But look at this, 32, verse 32. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, 
This is the only place in the Bible that you have a dash. Just a stop. And if not, if you will not forgive them, blot me, I pray thee out of the book which thou hast written. So what do we find about Moses in this story? Moses was prepared to the guy who take his name from the book of life just to save these people. Isn't that amazing? This is unselfish, self-sacrificial attitude. You so much care for God's glory and honor. What is Moses saying? What other nations will say, Lord? You brought them out of Egypt, your mighty hands stretched out, and now you destroyed it in the wilderness? Your name will be put to shame for the, so you the zeal for God's glory and honor of his name, and you were prepared to even you be sacrificed for ever taken from the book of life, just the people can live. That is the man of God. And absolutely, such a great love for God and his honor and for the people. And God said, okay, Moses, don't worry about that. I will blot out the name of the one who I will blot out. So God had a plan and still did not destroy the people. This is amazing, but you know what? Who else had that experience? Jesus Christ, that's right. So this is why they see 144,000, the son of Moses, both victory and self sacrificial and honor of God. Honor of God's name is on your uppermost. You know, we often think about our salvation. This is the most important thing in our life. Shall I be saved? It's important. But more important is God. God is always first. Even if I will be destroyed, God, you are first in my life. Your honor, your glory. And this is what Jesus was prepared. This is the song of Moses and of the Lamb. If you go, I will give you a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy. It's seven pages. Look at this. Brothers and sisters, your mind stops when you read these things. You cannot think further. This is why we will be studying the cross and what Jesus did throughout eternity. We do not take seriously or think seriously how great risk Christ, Christ has taken when he became a man and came to this earth. Look at this text. Yet, this is Desire of Ages 49. Yet into the world where Satan claimed dominion, God permitted his son to come, a helpless babe, subject to the weakness of humanity, weaknesses of humanity. He permitted him to meet life's peril in common with every human soul, to fight the battle as every child of humanity must fight it at the risk of failure and eternal loss. Would you send your child, would you give your child to such a peril to save someone else? a period of eternal loss. Christ could have sinned. Christ could have failed. And we cannot even understand what would have happened with the God and, and all this if he died. If he perished. Now one more. This is from uh, Zerbages. Never can the cost of our redemption be realized until the redeemed shall stand with the Redeemer before the throne of God. So until we come to the throne of God and see the glory and eternity and the beauty and the majesty of all this, we will never understand what heaven has done for us. Why? Then, as the glories of eternal home burst upon our enraptured senses, we should remember that Jesus left all this for us, that he not only became an exile from the heavenly courts, but for us, took the risk of failure and eternal loss. Then you will realize what he left to save you and me. What is divine love? This is why Paul says in Ephesians, I pray, I bow down, that you may understand what? The height, the depth, and the width, and the breadth of divine love. That is amazing, brothers and sisters. Amen. This love, 144,000 have understood and they put God first, as Moses put God first, as Jesus Christ put, uh, put uh, us and our salvation first. And this is why they follow him wherever he goes. They reflect his character. They have deep understanding of God's love. 
and what he has done for us. And then we go to verse 4, in Revelation 14. These are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb with us forever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb. I must tell you, the more I walk with the Lord, the more I see the sinfulness of this world, and the more I see my own imperfection, and you see the glory and beauty of God's character, you want to be like Him. So, brothers and sisters, when we come to the book of Revelation, we are having two classes of people that are represented by two women. So, you see, women here doesn't represent physical contact with a woman or, you know, with a man. It represents, it's a spiritual language, it's a figurative language. These women represent, one is a pure woman, another is defiled woman, corrupt woman, impure woman. And Bible gives us, in, for example, in chapter 12 of Revelation, John sees a woman, you know, dressed in the sun, clothed in the sun, and having, you know, the crown with 12 stars, and she's standing on the moon. That's a Christian church. She's pregnant, about to deliver. That's a representation of the church of God. And she's persecuted by the dragon. The dragon is there, you know, persecuting the child, persecuting the woman. But then, the opposing force is impure woman in that in Revelation 17. And that woman is dressed like a harlot, like a prostitute. She has a cup, golden cup, full of you know wine, of abominations, of false teachings, doctrines, and she's riding on the beast. She is in illicit, in improper relationship with the civil authorities, the kings and the merchants of the world. That is called battle. Yeah. And this is apostate religion today. They have false doctrines, false teachings, and they are in illicit, improper relationship with the governments and the people who have capital. Let me read about that woman. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore, that sitteth upon many waters. Waters represent people. So apostate church controls the people and she's in alliance with the kings and the rulers of the world. And then there is a message going in the world today, we call it the angels messages, which is an everlasting gospel. Calling people fear God and give glory to him. Fallen, fallen is the Babylon and the great. And if any man worship the beast and his image receive the mark on his forehead or in his hand. If you don't have God's name, read on your forehead, but you have that, you know, Mark of the beast. And he will drink the wine of the God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger. And then verse 2, Revelation 17. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So today, I was just in San Francisco uh, two days ago, and one brother who was taking me to the airport gave me a little tour. And then you can see these magnificent buildings, you know, uh, corporate head offices, uh, leading, you know, financial institutions, leading, you know, tech companies, because there is a Silicon Valley that's far away. A lot of money is there, right? So you're having all these institutions, financial, political, and so on. I'm not saying everybody's evil, but the opposite church is an association, an alliance with it. And but God's people are called to be separate, to be peculiar not to be intoxicated with the wine of Babylon. They belong to Christ. They follow the Lamb, wherever He goes. They are not... Doesn't mean that these people who are 144,000 at some point in time were not part of Babylon. But they come out of Babylon and they join God's people. They follow the Lamb, wherever He goes. These are the people. And let me now come to Hebrews 12, verse 1. If you want to know how to be part of 144,000, let me share with you a few thoughts. And here is in Hebrews 12, verse 1. If you want to know what you need to do to be part of this. Therefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So what is important here? Let us lay aside every weight 
And same with so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is. Yeah. So you see, there is a need to get rid of sin, get rid of you know uh, that will pulls us down. So easily beset us and run with patience. You know, this is the patience of the saints running the race set before us. So how to become one of the hundred forty-four thousand overcomers in the Bible? Verse two, looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured what? The cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So 144,000 are looking constantly at Jesus, looking at Jesus moment by moment, every day. What are you looking at? You're looking at Gethsemane. You're looking at Calvary, what he went through in his life. Endure the cross. We often are brethren so easily discouraged. And we look at different difficulties in our life, be it whatever, health issues, financial issues, family issues, or even in the church, we can be discouraged. But here, the 144,000, they are looking at Christ, the author, the beginner, founder of the faith, and finisher, the one who can finish it. And looking at Christ, his experience, he is set down at the throne of God. He is now the right hand of God, he overcame, he gave his life, he resurrected, he is now ascended, and he is in the heavenly sanctuary, he is finishing the work. Verse 3, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest he be weary and faint in their minds. Today, there is a danger for God's people, who will be 144,000, to be discouraged, to be weary, and to simply give up. And to look at other people, not looking at Jesus, but we need to look at Christ. Verse 4, we have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Brothers and sisters, what do you think about this? Striving unto the blood. What does it mean? There is a problem, there is a sin in our life. Do we spend time on our knees? Do we fast and pray? Do we look unto Jesus? Do we plead with him? Are we in anguish and can wrestle with him in prayer? Or we just easily give up? Oh, I cannot do this. No, 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 no. These people are victorious. They resist even unto the blood. And then, what is the ultimate result? The ultimate result is the hearts maturing of the crop, grain. And to do that, you need something. And we are told in the book of James, what do we need to be ready for the harvest? James 5, 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waited for the precious fruit of the earth, and he had a long patience for it, until he receives the early event, like the rain. So what do we need to be ready for the harvest? We need a lot of rain. Are we aware of that? Do you know that we live in the time of the latter of rain? Are we asking, are we praying for the latter of rain? Yeah, that's something that we should. So see, we have patience of the saints, waiting until the coming of the Lord. And the husband, farmers, they are patient, waiting patiently for the precious fruits of the earth, and has a long patience for it, long patience, until he receives the early and latter rain. Zechariah 10, 1. Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. Are we living in the time of the latter rain today? We do. Do you know that in 1888 we are told that the drops of the latter rain started to fall? But then it was suspended. People were not ready. But we are living right now in the time of the latter rain. We need to pray for the latter rain. We need to pray for the Holy Spirit coming upon us, you know, in power to energize us, to take, you know, to be transformed and to give testimony to the world. This is the sealing of 144,000. We need to be sealed with the seal of the living God in our foreheads. And then Revelation 14, 5, in the mouth was found no God, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Let me reflect very briefly in conclusion on this text. 
No guile to the act. We know guile typically stands for lie, deceit, dishonesty. But there is more to it. 144,000 have that are similar to Jesus, they reflect the character of Christ perfectly. And let me share with you what it means for Christ not having a guide. 1 Peter 2.21 For even that he unto where he called, because Christ also suffered for us. Living in this example that you should follow his steps. You and I are called to follow in Jesus' steps. How? 21, 22. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him who judged righteously. You see what it means to have no guile according to this text. Jesus was perfectly righteous person. No sin. Even he said, Who of you can con convict me of sin? Pilate admitted, I find no fault with his man. He's innocent. Yeah. And then how was he treated? He was mistreated. Falsely accused. And how did he respond to these false accusations and mistreatment? Revival again and threaten not. When people step on our toes, what do we do? Fighting back. Animosity, hatred, whatever. Christ did not do it. It doesn't mean that we simply acknowledge that wrong is right or black is white, you know, but we say in the spirit of Christ. We are absolutely honest, transparent people. Amen. And it's very important today, I'll tell you, today to find people who are truly Christ like in that sense is rare. Because, and this is a great test today, how you can check where you spiritually stand. Think how you treat people who mistreat you or misrepresent you. That's a very good test whether you have reached following the steps of Jesus Christ. And then, brethren, here we are at the end of our study. I looked and behold, among Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice of heaven, like a roar of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on the harps, the singer son of Moses, the song of the Lamb, song of victory, honoring God, and faithfulness, loyalty to God, even if my life will be lost. I stand for God. These are 144,000. We are told there are 12 tribes, and I have characteristics of different tribes of sons of Jacob, right? So they're different. They're not uniform. They have different traits of character, but they all reflect the image of Jesus. Throughout the whole world, there will be 144,000. And we have privilege to be among them because they will spend eternity with Jesus Christ. They will be with him wherever he goes. And brothers and sisters, if you want to spend eternity and follow Christ in heaven, we have to follow him first here, wherever he goes. Yes. Whatever decision in life you have to make, think, would Jesus be with me? Do I follow Christ in this course of action, in these words that I speak? Is this what Jesus would do, right? They follow him first here, and their journey continues in eternity. These people will prepare the way to the second coming of Christ. They will receive, receive the latter of rain, they will give the loud cry. They will brighten that the glory of God will be revealed in the whole world. Revelation 18. And so the earth was lightened with glory of God. This is what we expect. This is the righteousness of Christ. May this experience be our experience. And may you and I be among 144,000. Amen. Amen.
and the Father's name. This is something that we really need to look at very carefully in our lives. As it's been said, we must strive with all the God-given power that we have to be among the 144,000. Let us all go on bending knee together and Brother Walter will have our closing prayer. <coughs> Most loving, gracious Father in heaven, in this accepted hour, as we come to the close of our worship service, Lord, we come to you just as we are. We know that you love us. We know that you have a good plan for each one of us. We are in amazement as we behold the land, a land that takes away the sins of the world. Father, we thank you for giving your Son giving him forever to be one of us, to be a human, at such a high risk, such a peril, that he could be eternally lost. Oh, Father, help us to understand your, that your, your great love. We, our mind, our capacity for understanding is so limited to understand who you are. Open our mind with the Holy Spirit, that we may appreciate, truly appreciate your great love and the great sign of us in your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to behold him by faith and to live. Help us to be forgiven for all our sins. And also, Father, we pray that you give us a saving faith, that we can lay hold of that power that is in the gospel of thy son, Jesus Christ, that he may live in us by faith, that you can live in us, that you write, you put your law in our mind and write it in our heart, that we may reflect your image perfectly, that whatever we do and say may be pleasing to you. Oh, Father, as we contemplated 144,000, help us to have desire to be part of that group. Help us to fully surrender our lives and our plans into your hands. Help us to be your, that your holy name may be in our forehead, that we may reflect you perfectly, that we will be holy people as thou holy. Oh Lord, may we have that experience of victory because it is possible that God all things are possible. Amen. Bless us individually and bless us collectively. Bless our fellowship in the remaining hours of the Holy Sabbath day. And Lord, prepare us for coming that you will be glorified, that we would have part in the great, mighty, great and mighty movement when the whole earth will be lightened with your glory, with the revelation of the character of Jesus. Forgive us our sins, our shortcomings, and give us the grace and bless the people around the world and unite us in the holy faith. We ask all these things and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.